I would like to call the meeting to order. And I also would like to announce the, uh, the audio video recording of this meeting and approval of the minutes of December 16th. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Um, I would um, like to introduce Mary Ann Winters, who um, is a director of Safe Passage here in Northampton. And um, we had Mary Ann Winters come before to Social Services and Veterans Affairs, and it's an honor to have you back. Great to be back. And I don't know if you would like to speak a little bit before you start. Um, you know, I, I could just sort of give you a sort of an overview of where we're at and kind of get started and uh, that would be great. Um, Pam, do you, do you need my thumb drive or do you have No, the, I have the thumb drive. Okay, that's great. Thank you, thanks. So um, the, the, the PowerPoint that, that she's setting up, I have copies of in the folder, so follow along. But um, I really was um, just hoping to kind of give you an update see if you have any questions about state passage in general. I think you're familiar in general with what we do and, and who we are. Um, it's always good to kind of you know, have the mission statement in, in our vision. Um, a couple of years ago, we did some work to um, to really think through our, our vision in a new way as we were developing our strategic plan. So we, um, we launched a strategic plan about two and a half years ago. So we're midway through a five-year plan and um, really worked on um, our vision as a, um, a mechanism for getting someplace new rather than being against or opposed to something. And that was a big shift for Safe Passage that we all, you know, the staff and the board really embraced. And so um, we found that ever since then, it just changes our work slightly, but it changes everything in a way that, you know, we're working on um, creating the kind of community where domestic violence is not tolerated, where sort of peace and prosperity and safety, all of those things that need to be in place in order for domestic violence not to flourish are there. And so it kind of changes our, um, our focus in some ways. So we changed our focus in terms of our community work and also in terms of our one-on-one -on -one work with survivors. So, um, you know, we still do the kinds of things that we've been doing all along, the, you know, immediate crisis intervention, we get phone calls, even up until like 20 minutes before I got here, from people who, you know, have had an escalation in the violence that's been committed against them or a uh, new revelation in terms of a child disclosing or so, you know, crisis so we work, you know, with people in varying levels of crisis. And then once we help work with them to get through that crisis by building options and by building that sense of safety, we, um, we, we can work with that, with the people that we work with to help them envision a life that's actually free of violence and really, you know, turn to them and ask them, you know, what, what does that look like for you? You know, because I, I can't say what that would look like for you or you or anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so, so this sort of vision of, you know, lives without violence and what they really look like as opposed to a life without violence, you know, is, um, is a change for us um, in a good way. It really kind of opens up the discussion. So we're, our intention is to really, in Hampshire County, be the leader around creating this vision and creating a community that supports nonviolence, but it promotes all of the things that need to be in place for violence to not happen, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what that's like is community, economic opportunities, um, you know, housing options, um, education options, job training, access. So it really is, you know, like our work is also about creating those types of things. The other thing we did as part of our strategic plan work is um, create a new prevention program called Say Something. You may have heard of that. Um, it's, we started with uh, 
you know, kind of a very intentional thinking process. Hello. Hi. I'm Gina Louise. Hi, Gina. Sorry. Hi, Gina. That's okay. Hi, so I have this set up for you. Can I just interrupt for just a second? Sure. Yeah. You should be able to work the slides with this mouse. Okay. Okay. That's our, our new vision statement. Um, we are going to doing some work on our mission statement also because we are also finding that as we work more deeply within the community and really sort of look at domestic violence, um, the, the role of men in that work changes and the need of men sometimes for that support. So we're working more and more in GLBT communities and um, you know really working with people of all genders. Um, you know, we're still finding that the vast majority of our work is with women and their children, and at the same time, we want to make sure that people know that you know it's really about to a partner violence. It's not um, necessarily all about violence against women, although it's very interconnected. So IPV stands for intimate partner violence. So this is just kind of a model of some of the different ways that we see intimate partner violence. Um, being acted out. You know, most people are, are aware of the physical sex and sexual elements of that. They think of, you know, it's hitting, punching, and the very worst homicide. Uh, but there's also elements of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, that um, don't necessarily involve physical, um, physical violence, such as sexual violence. Things like, you know, enforcing isolation and, you know, losing social connections where the abuser sort of isolates a person is one form. Um, humiliation, verbal abuse, the kinds of things that really erode someone's self-esteem and sense of self-worth are sometimes part of that, but sometimes that's really the, the key um, component of, of domestic violence. So we really work on it as a broad picture, and some of the acts of violence are also have legal consequences, so they're crimes, and sometimes they're not necessarily illegal, but they're still abusive. Okay, so there's a whole continuum. So, for example, controlling someone's financial affairs. You know, it's not it's not you know illegal for one person to hold all the money and to dole out their money to their partner. Um, it's illegal if that person then steals the person's identity and opens up credit cards in their name. You know, so there's for each sort of type of, of violence, there's legal consequences sometimes, there may be medical consequences sometimes, and so along with that broad picture of, of intimate partner violence, we also have a broad perspective of intervention and a lot of collaborations that go along with that. Um, um, yes. The verbal abuse, mm -hmm. do you get a lot of that? Oh, I think that most, most situations I've ever heard of include some component of verbal abuse, for sure. You know, it's sometimes it's sort of yelling or intimidation, but sometimes it's the more quiet but really hurtful kinds of, um, you know, I think it's, you know, it's, sometimes it looks like, you know, convincing someone that they're not worthwhile or that their interests are not valid or silly or trivial or that they really don't have sort of worth as, as a person. And when that gets repeated over and over again by an abuser, Yes, sometimes the victim begins to almost believe it themselves. It almost kind of gives up. Like a lot of victims call us when they feel like they're about at that sort of giving up point or that that point where it's just so painful and the the difference between 
what they kind of know or do about themselves feels more and more distant. So it's a huge emotional crisis at that moment too. So one of the things we've been working on in the last couple of years is really getting an understanding of what financial abuse looks like. And um, you know, every couple has arrangements they make around finances. If one person's better at keeping track of the bills or one person balances a checkbook or whatever, uh, but financial abuse is different than that. It's really a, a way to exert that power over somebody. Um, we've, we've started working more in um, the hill towns of Hampshire County through a subcontract with the Hilltop Community Health Center. And um, financial abuse is a huge form of domestic violence that takes place in isolated rural areas. Um, and it's around means of communication, transportation. You know, we've heard of abusers who monitor the odometer on the car and then the victim has to account for you know what were those 10 miles where, where did you go you know uh, those 30 miles of things um, so for some yeah there's certain sort of tactics that abusers use that you know that we kind of become familiar with unfortunately and in certain situations abusers can take those ta tactics and sort of magnify them you know um, abusing authority, um, you know, it may not sound like, you know, that could be a tactic of abuse, but um, when an abuser um, sort of interferes with like children's education or with um, privacy in a medical situation, things like that, that, um, that interfere with that person's, with the victim's privacy and sort of means to, to their own control, the control over their lives or their bodies. Um, so we've added a whole um, part of our curriculum and our new training on financial abuse and really helping people get a, get a picture of what that looks like. Um, we've also worked a lot with people whose um, identities were stolen by the abuser. You know, people think of like identity theft as you know, someone goes through your garbage and gets your social security number or something. But what we're finding more and more is that it's people in abusive situations who are um, who are taking out credit cards, taking out loans. We had a, a three-year-old in shelter, and um, when the mother ran, ran a credit check, check um, on the child's social security number, found that all of the utilities were in the child's name. And so not only did the mother have to clear up her own credit in order to get a new apartment, but you know, had a three-year-old little girl who, you know, now is like so in debt because of uh, because of that. So How do you do that? It's yeah. oh, it's. <laughs> I never heard of such a thing. Well, you know, if you have access to some of the social security number and some of the key pieces, and you can make a slight alteration, or if they don't ask the birth date, you know, and they can, you, know, you can like build credit based on a social security number. So how do they? So, eliminate that problem with that child at three years old who's got a tremendous bad credit here. Well, we've started working more and more with bankers. We now have a relationship with Greenfield Savings Bank who can help us in situations where, you know, the abuser has, for example, you know, bounce checks in the joint checking account. So now the victim doesn't have access to a new account. So they can help us kind of clear those things up. It, it's really kind of case by case. Sometimes like fraud protection agencies have to come in. Sometimes it needs to be reported, you know, as identity theft, and that starts the process of undoing those things. It, it really, it partly depends on um, how long ago these things happened and, you know, what, what all was set in motion. So in that particular case, along with the utility card, the utilities, the abuser took out a credit card in the same social security number. So the credit card was just on an electronic payment. So you know, the utilities were getting paid, but on this credit card. And so it wasn't so much that, that there were un, unpaid utility bills until after, after the woman left and came to shelter. So it was very, you know, it's a scam. It's, a, you know, it's awful. Right, but I, you know, I had never thought about, I'd always thought about identity theft as kind of being like, you know, a stranger or somebody who, you know, Got your got your information somehow, and you know we're all taught to shred everything and that kind of stuff. But um, that's sort of one thing. Another big area that's kind of emerging in um, this work is the idea of reproductive um, reproductive coercion. There's some new research that that tells us 
something about the incidence of um, controlling sort of reproductive issues as part of the abuse. And we've, we've seen documented cases where um, the abuser may mess with the victim's birth control and kind of force or coerce a pregnancy. Or on the other side of that, force or coerce an abortion. Um, or, you know, so, so kind of this use of like the victim's body as the you know, terms of like denying her choices around her own reproduction is another sort of issue of connection. So we're working more and more collaboration with Tapestry Health and some of the other medical providers around around that. One of the one of the best collaborations I think we have in shelter is that we have a weekly visit from a nurse practitioner who works with people around a lot of the basic primary care issues. People come to shelter sometimes without their prescriptions for their basic medications or for the kids or with untreated or undiagnosed illnesses. And because we have um, we have one of four fully um, accessible rooms in the state in an emergency domestic violence shelter, we work a lot with people with disabilities. And um, sometimes that's permanent you know, lifelong disabilities, but sometimes it's either post-surgery, post-birth, or post-injury. So people so come. Only four in the whole state. There's four rooms in the in the domestic violence yeah. emergency shelter um, network yeah. that are fully accessible. Some are partially accept accessible, but um, when our shelter was renovated in 2002, um, we put in two kitchen services. So there's a, a wheelchair accessible counter and a height accessible counter. And, there was a bathroom with a roll-in shower. Um, the, the fire alarms are both sound and light. So there are a lot of accessibility features that, you know, at that time, just got built into those renovations. Uh, there's an elevator that goes into the building itself, and then an elevator, they got a chair elevator that can get somebody to the second floor. So the accessible room is on the first floor, and then available, you know, all of the, all of the common area mm -hmm. space is then available that way. It's funny because when I came to give my donation, mm -hmm. and I've never been up there, and I assumed the door would just open up when I had the handle, and no way. You mean at our office? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have, yeah, we do require people to, to ring the doorbell, and there's a there's a window there, um, and sometimes if the, if the if, if there's no one at the desk, we have a we have a camera that um, shows an image of whoever's in the hallway on our computers so we can pull up it out you know from any any of our computers because there was a girl at the desk right mm -hmm. and but i just never knew i didn't know why it was locked mm -hmm. well, almost every day er, almost every person who comes in is coming in without you know now, do you do yeah. that for safety because yeah, you might totally have um, a person that you're trying to help and you have rooms in there where you're talking to them privately? Yeah, our counselors work out of our office. So um, all of our community clients, you know, that are, you know, with our shelter guests are living in shelter. And unless there's been some breach of confidentiality, most of them originated from a city outside of Northampton. And so their abuser probably is not nearby and hopefully doesn't know where they are. So in some ways, they've escaped that abuse. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we still work really hard to make sure that that stays anonymous. Um, but the, we work with more people actually who are living in community and in various situations of abuse uh, or violence. And so, and, and our office, you know, our, our office location is you know, anybody can look it up and it's online. So we know that abusers, you know, can find out where we are, can sometimes follow, follow a victim. Um, so we do space. take those precautions. You and your staff need to be safe too. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, if we have, we, we love our location right next to the police department mm -hmm. because um, if we have any question, you know, so, I mean, the victims are the, are the best ones to tell us and to tell themselves sort of what the abuser is likely to do. And one of the patterns of many abusers is that they can be terrorists in in the house, but then be charming and appear very nice and calm and peaceful. In is public. that like a split personality or something? Or well, I don't know that, that it. I don't know that it would be clinically a split personality, but certainly it kind of shows that abuse is not about just kind of losing control. You know, because abusers, the tactics of abuse are very kind of intentional. So 
um, it's pretty common, and I don't know, you know, I know you know a lot of web justice grounds also, where you know it's pretty common for that public persona, you know, if, you, if you've read things in the paper about you know a violent episode or a, mm -hmm. the victim who goes to get a restraining order, or this, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it, it always seems so quiet over there. You know, this neighborhood never has had that problem. You know, we, we read that a lot when there's a, a violent episode or a homicide. Would that be, I'm trying to figure this out, mm -hmm. would this be because the partners, the partner actually is seen where the weak parts are, are on that partner and, and intimidates that and escalates? Or, I don't know. That's, that's such a deep question in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, it could be one thing, but it's like an abusive dynamic very often stays very hidden within that household or within that relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think bringing the issue of domestic violence out into the open and to the surface is so challenging because very often the abusers are people that people interact with every day or have, you know, positions of prominence or in business or government or wherever, you know, and so sometimes it's hard for people to make that connection. So, you know, it's similar if you talk with people who have had, have dealt with child abuse, you know, where, where they can describe, you know, I've certainly talked with, with friends and, and clients who, you know, describe kind of an outward personality of the family and then what's really happening inside. It's, it's very similar. Well, I think same so. passage is wonderful. I used them twice. I had a very dear friend of mine up in Leeds mm -hmm. who had called me with verbal abuse mm -hmm. and was not a nice sight. And that that she, that she described being verbally abused, or, yeah. uh huh, mm -hmm. and pushing and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I had called um, Captain Caucus worked with him very closely, mm -hmm. we had a plan put in place, mm -hmm. and it happened. Nice. And... Mm -hmm. It happened went, in terms of her getting safety? They moved yeah. him out of there, mm -hmm. and she went to St. Passage, and mm -hmm. just were wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then, just recently, I had another friend of mine here in Northampton, young, in her 40s, who ran into a problem also. Mm -hmm. She did one visit. Mm -hmm. And we can't get her back. We're mm -hmm. trying to get her back. Huh. But if, if she got at least some message that there's support there, you know. And I know. We're trying you know, to get it into her head. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes it's, you know, there's a process that, that survivors go through, too, where they exactly. go right up to that point of decision and then try to make it work. You know, because one of the dynamics, um, one of the dynamics of, domestic violence is that there's also love there, you know, and then nobody starts a relationship. That is true, because that's you know? what the second problem is right, right now. Right, and so nobody starts a relationship thinking, oh, this is going to be a violent relationship and it's going to be awful. They start a relationship with all of the good things in a relationship, and so the longer that goes, the I, I think sometimes the more ambivalent or back and forth. Because this is about like the divorce, mm -hmm. but the love is still there, but right. there's hatred, and it's like, Right, and people have to make that decision for safety, like, can I love this person and leave this person at the same time? They did. You know, and sometimes they do. One thing we're finding statistically, some of the national research seems to indicate that domestic violence or the violent relationships on the average seem to be lasting less time. Hmm. So that's some interesting research that, you know, and but we, still, we still hear from people who've been in abusive relationships for 50 years. But it seems that there's more people who, a few more people anyway, who recognize the warning signs earlier and might get help or might not sort of enter in as deeply in the relationship. So it seems like and we're watching that because it's just a slight difference in some of the research is showing, but I find that really interesting and wonder if there's enough community awareness or at least a little bit more now that people are, are, are Do you think like a woman? You're, you're using an example like 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Compared to now, I would say within the past nine, 10 years, where I've seen more women coming out and being more vocal, mm -hmm. and it was such a hidden thing right. way back. Right. And it was the fright of mm -hmm. opening your mouth and being vocal. 
Right, of being vocal and then having systems that had no well, idea exactly. how, to, how to address it. And I don't know if you if you um, saw that as part of the lead up to the hot chocolate run, um, the you know the news director at um, WHMP did a series, uh, an interview with her mother. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, if you caught this, but um, I think the podcasts for this are still on the, the radio station's website. They're definitely worth the time of looking at. But she, in the 70s, her mother was being battered by her father. And she interviewed her mother and put together this series of podcasts about their story. And it was, it was so moving. I mean, I, I was really honored to be part of this. The, you know, to be in the room while they had this conversation, but uh, she put it together with kind of split it into themes and you know, music and things. But um, and then they helped lead off the walk and, and things at, at the hot chocolate run. So, um, but she kind of told the story about like going to a judge or going to a pastor or going to friends, and you know, people had no idea even how to how to respond. Um, you know, and uh, just some really horrible. So I think systemically, there's some, been some system improvements, and at the same time, we're still, our shelter is always full, and we're still at, you know, a huge capacity. I mean, I, it's hard to know what our real capacity is, because our counselors somehow, as new crises come up, you know, sort of embrace, embrace the people that are coming to us, you know, but we're working with probably 1,200 different people in a year. Um, about 100 of them comes with shelter, about 500 we work with face-to-face, -face, and then the rest we're working with on the hotline. So that kind of gives you a sense of what we're doing. And I want to do a little time check. I'm probably yeah. going to skip through some of these just because I brought some background information, but mm -hmm. I wanted to get at some of the things that we are, oh, going backwards, sorry, um, that we are working on. Um, So, so, so this is a little bit of a, you know, kind of a summary of the kinds of things that we do. We work in kind of all different levels of um, this work. Um, in public health terms, it's kind of called a social ecological model, where you work on you know, individual level all the way to the societal level. Um, but our, you know, we have our individual work as counseling hotline, crisis intervention. We do safety planning individually. In terms of relationships, we, we have support groups available. We also do training for bystanders, which is kind of the rest of us. So bystander training is really focused on um, teaching people the specific things that they can do to be part of the solution around domestic violence. So um, that's, our, that's the basis of our prevention work. We do a lot of systems advocacy, um, you know, community response. We work very closely with the Northwestern District Attorney's Office with um, medical programs and policy. We look at the statewide level. Um, there's a, a really important um, development in the field is uh, a tech or technique or, or <coughs> a collaboration called high risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And we have a high risk assessment team in Hampshire County and in Franklin County coordinated through the DA's office. And basically they look at, um, they basically they basically get referrals from law enforcement and from domestic violence advocates um, uh, and take in cases that appear to be very at high risk for potential homicide. So they're looking at risk from the viewpoint of risk of a perpetrator committing or attempting homicide. So they're, you know, and part of that is the risk of the victim, but the whole idea of like risk assessing is really shifted in some ways to thinking about the risk of the perpetrator. And then that team is a collaborative team of different people, including a safe passage representative. And they work specifically <coughs> on, on safety planning, on contacting the victim, on maybe connecting with the perpetrator's employer, or if the perpetrator has you know, outstanding warrants, or is on probation, things like that. So they can really sort of bring a lot of resources to these high-risk identified cases. And um, the trends nationally are showing that in communities that have really adopted this, that the homicide rates seem to be either leveling or going down. I mean, it's really difficult to tell in New Hampshire County because, you know, the smaller population, you know, we haven't had a homicide, we didn't have a homicide in 2014. We've had two homicides since I've arrived at St. Passage about three and a half years ago. So it's hard to sort of, with a small numbers to start with, to really 
see that as a trend, but the, the high risk assessment team is very active in this meeting twice a month to really assess and work through these cases. It's kind of one of those behind the scenes things that mm -hmm. I think is making a huge difference. We work a lot at policy level, working on protocols, um, working with employers and medical providers and our own protocols around um, addressing you know, domestic violence in the workplace or in healthcare settings, things like that. And then, you know, societal-wide advocacy around social justice, so outreach, community organizing, without prevention work. So that kind of... <coughs> and I don't see, um, is there public kind of education and outreach in this? Well, around the societal work, and in terms of bystander training is the prevention model, you know, the, the model of prevention is bystander training, and then our outreach and community organizing is um, within that. Um, we do do some sort of outreach and kind of outright education, but our prevention model is really more about educating people on sort of what to say and how to act kind of within their own spheres of influence. So if a parent goes through this training, they might be thinking about how they can teach their kids as their sort of <coughs> in general and kinds of how to address issues. So it's not so much that we have like education where we go into the school system and K through 12 or, or whatever, although we'll go in you know, as, as invited. It's really more organized, helping sort of bring people in as kind of volunteers in their own lives, you know, and, and helping them and supporting them in that work. So. And then the other question you know I have to ask this is about perpetration prevention. Is that, um, does that fit somewhere into the the well, kind of community organizing you're doing, the outreach, the education. The yeah, the, the whole approach of our prevention work is that is basically that it's called say something. And so the premise is that anybody can say something to help <coughs> prevent perpetration, prevent domestic violence from even starting in the first place. You know, and it's really kind of a matter of learning about domestic violence, learning about perpetration, and thinking about what you can do in those moments where maybe a, a lot of times it's easier for people to sort of sort of understand what I think about young people. But you know, if you start to see behaviors that seem to be um, abusive or controlling, you know, sitting down and really becoming that young person before. So a lot of the prevention is really about trying to identify those behaviors that seem to be kind of warning signs that if they're not really, you know, if they don't go unchecked, you know. So what are the resources that you can bring people into when they are at risk for perpetration <coughs> or identified as such? Well, that really kind of depends on each, you know, on, on each person and the age and where they're at, but we have resources, you know, we, we have connections with Moving Forward, which is the Batters Intervention Program if people have actually committed violence. And then you know we work with you know, school counselors, with parenting groups, with um, medical facilities, and um, we're also trying to train the people in sort of all those institutions, you know, on, on that. So it's kind of at the beginning stages, and I wouldn't say that there's a nicely drawn up research, you know, because very few people really sort of work in that area. We're hoping that people more and more begin to call for that. You know, and I can give you one example from my own experience as a pattern, uh, or as a parent. Um, when our youngest was about 14, and his, his mom died, and then, you know, and uh, we became his guardians, he, he was looking for a specific shirt in the laundry like, Where'd that shirt go? Where'd that shirt go? I, I want to wear my wife beater shirt, is what he said, right? And so that meant, like, that white, you know, a white, you know, sort of um, tank top. And so that was kind of my moment of saying something like, okay, <laughs> let's not like freak out, you know, let's like talk about like, where'd you hear that? You know, do you know? But let's think about it. So I, I had this conversation with him. Um, you know, it worked better for him to have the conversation in the car on the way to and from a McDonald's. So we did that, you know. And, you know, he kind of talked to me and, and actually kind of listened about to the words behind that. And he never really thought about it. He just never really thought about that. And, his, you know, his mom's boyfriend had been using that term, you know, since he was little, and, you know, so it was kind of that opportunity to kind of just, like, raise that awareness with him. And that's the kind of thing that we work with parents and teachers to do, you know. It wasn't that, or he thought this was, he called this a white feeder shirt, so therefore, 
you know, now he's definitely going to be a perpetrator, but it was really like me, you know, taking that time to kind of educate him. And so I kind of think about that, you know, a lot when I think about the kinds of opportunities that we're trying to match people up with in their own lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> um, so let's, sorry, I got you kind of off track here. Yeah, that's okay. It's all right. Um, so some of the things that we've worked on in our the first half of our five-year strategic plan, um, we've done some work on reforming our volunteer program. Um, we've broadened it to include our prevention program and sort of bringing people in as opportunities to go through this training. Um, we've broadened our work around mental health, um, specifically you know in the shelter and in, the, in our community program. But we now have a, a mental health clinician who spends one day a week at the shelter. They do an assessment of every new um, person who comes in <coughs> and do a weekly group on sort of mental health and PTSD um, sort of strategies. Um, we've coordinated our, our outreach and social media communications in a new way and developed a new website to establish our prevention program. We've expanded our legal program both in um, capacity by increasing the amount of hours that our legal program director works and also eligibility. So we've opened up eligibility to people with slightly higher incomes than before. And um, we've also worked out a, a close connection with um, community legal aid. And so, you know, they can, you know, if, if someone's eligible for <coughs> a representation through community legal aid, we can do like an initial intake and we work very closely with them. And then we, we have a panel of attorneys that we can pay a small stipend to for full representation in probate and family court issues. So that's been an expanded program. Um, our children's program has expanded. Um, we're about to hire a shelter children's advocate, um, which we're beginning to advertise for now. Um, our disability program has become a little bit more um, sort of robust, <coughs> as you all know. And then we've put some resources into a subcontract with um, the Hilltown Community Health Center for Rural Towns. So this is kind of some of the areas in the last few years that we've expanded. What we're hoping is next. Um, it's like Barack Obama, you know, <laughs> in the right-hand corner. It does. <laughs> it's just a, a, one of those uh, stock photos. But <laughs> <laughs> so what, you know, some of our intentions into the next two and a half or three years, um, there is more and more work now helping people understand the connections around health and domestic violence. Um, I'm going to a conference at the end of March to to um, to hear about sort of protocols and um, training and screening procedures that are happening across the country um, in terms of relationships with domestic violence programs and um, healthcare organizations. And of course, the healthcare organizations <coughs> in our area are closely connected as sponsors to the Hot Chocolate Run, and we're working on sort of protocols for screening both in the emergency um, and urgent care, but also in ongoing work. There's a lot of research that's really showing um, a huge connection between trauma, intimate partner violence, and longer, some of the longer term health consequences like heart disease, gastrointestinal problems, different cancers. And so we know that, you know, in every sort of medical arena, there are survivors of intimate partner violence who are being diagnosed and being treated. And so we want to be a part of sort of helping um, helping make those connections for, with folks. Um, we're also working on more and more on the economic impact. You know, if financial abuse is part of the dynamic, then rebuilding someone's economic life or building it to begin with is a big part of our work. Um, transitional housing, we still identify as a huge gap in this area. There's no domestic violence focused transitional housing in Hampshire or Franklin County. Um, there is some in Hampton County. Um, but most of the transition, and by transitional housing, I mean like a, there's, a, there's sort of two to five year programs that have some staffing availability, some programming. Um, so it's for, for folks that aren't necessarily quite ready for sort of, you know, being sort of in the community housing, but it's still supported, but it's not like an emergency shelter. It's still separate apartments or townhouses, that sort of thing. Um, it's a huge gap in this area. Integrative or complementary therapies. There's also more and more research that really um, that really is showing incredible benefit in terms of trauma and recovery 
with things like yoga and massage and Reiki and um, the kinds of uh, more integrated mind body spirit mm -hmm. kinds of connections, which we've already always embraced, but I think now there's like real like real research that shows that your brain can mend itself under circumstances of using mindfulness techniques and things like that. Um, reproductive justice I touched on, but sort of you know, interested in really kind of delving more into that. Um, expansion of prevention, um, and then the issue of vicarious trauma. Again, we, we know more and more about the, um, the difficulties that our counselors and advocates can experience after being exposed to all the stories and the crisis and the trauma, and really our responsibility as an organization in, in taking steps to help alleviate that and be the kind of organization that supports our staff and our peers in addressing that. So those are some of our intentions. Um, Can I ask another question? Or sure. Rushing here. So you're, you know that I have to ask you this as well because of our shared, we've worked together in the past. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering if um, you're moving in the direction of thinking about alternatives to um, law enforcement and prosecution <coughs> and are there any restorative justice oriented programs that um, you're working with or policy wise kind of working towards anything along those lines? Um, we haven't worked specifically on restorative justice. We've, we've learned a little bit about that, but um, a lot of the work we're focusing on now is really about creating the conditions for well-being and sort of whatever that looks like. So it, it sort of takes takes the vision work that we work work with, with client with our clients to do and then help them figure out how to make that vision a reality for themselves. Sometimes that involves the criminal justice approach, sometimes it totally doesn't. And so, you know, it's really about sort of individualized um, support and case management and listening to someone's sort of concerns with regard to their Geography, their geography and their age and their culture and all of those things. So, um, but we haven't really dealt specifically into restorative justice yet. Okay. Is okay. there a movement at all away from um, convincing people to necessarily separate long term from partners? I mean, what and do you have? Do you are you collecting numbers around people that are returning to their partners um, and that kind of thing? We are doing more and more to collect those numbers. And um, we've, we've, we've really studied the research that is showing that um, there seems to be, have been nationally sometimes a disconnect between what survivors are stating that they need and what domestic violence programs are actually providing. Um, you know, we've always had an empowerment approach. So, you know, we work with people. We don't say, you know, the only, the only way that you can get safe is by leaving your abuser because we know that sometimes people want to stay with their abuser or get back with the abuser, they just want the violence to stop. And so we definitely work, you know, work with people um, around how, to, you know, the kinds of ways that that can be done with accountability and, you know, with real safety, you know. And as you can imagine, it's, um, it's a hard road for our counselors to, to work with people because, you know, it seems like, you know, separating is, is, is um, almost kind of the easiest thing in some ways, but it's, a, it's also difficult. But if, if her relationship or family can stay intact, and especially with, that, with families where the family is, as a whole are isolated, maybe they're part of an immigrant community, maybe they don't have a lot of people around, maybe that family together can bring more financial resources and the kids will be better off. So we're really kind of looking at a lot of those possibilities with people. There are times we're working with um, the whole family, um, especially when there are children involved, and our children's advocate will work also with, with the abuser. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's tricky too. So, you know, you asked me, you know, first, like, what can we do together, right? So, um, and so some of the things that we've talked about, like, one of our biggest areas that we work on every single day is housing. Um, there are also, uh, I have some, some more details. This, this whole, the whole idea of, um, we're certainly um, interested in, in helping the city work at, work on sort of domestic violence as an employer. There's a ton of employment law issues around domestic violence. Um, 
working on promoting some of the economic collaborations that we need to really sort of help people with their economic um, issues. And I think Northampton has a lot of sort of economic uniqueness in terms of how it's structured and the um, entrepreneurial spirit and the local um, emphasis that really sort of is, um, is a positive thing for domestic violence survivors. So a lot of survivors, when they come to shelter, realize what kind of community this is and really want to stay. And so, and the part of that is because of the economic climate. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Because as you might know, the city council is considering a new project on Pleasant Street that is um, yes. low income housing for specifically for families. Um, yes. I, I don't know if your organization has taken a position for or against that particular housing, but I'm wondering if you can speak to that need for low income right. housing for specifically for families, not yes. necessarily. Well, we would really encourage this committee to take the stance of allocating the CPA funding for affordable housing. We've been watching that, um, sort of keeping track of that, of that debate. Um, you know, I could think of, you know, four or five families who would do so well in a situation like that. Um, partly because of the access to job opportunities and educational opportunities. Um, partly because of the affordability and you know, people who really would want to gain and contribute to a community um, would be amazing. And, and many of the people that come to shelter, that either come to shelter or they're trying to get safer and want to separate from their abusers, find that they need to move out. You know, that the economic situation when they're together with, with their abuser may work for them to live here, but you know, they have to, you know, they, they have to relocate to East Hampton or Holyoke or Springfield or someplace, um, which means disrupting their kids from school, that sort of thing. So, for people in the community who want to relocate and keep all of their supports and their kids' education in place, it's it's so important that that um, that has to be available. So, we really strongly support that. Um, you know, we would love to work with the city, and this is kind of a long term on the whole idea of transitional housing. Um, but what? Um, um, transitional housing, so a, sort of a step. Um, but you know, emergency shelter isn't an answer. Emergency shelter is a stopgap. And so sometimes people say, well, do you need a new shelter? And I usually say, no, oh, we need a community that has more places where people can, you know, can find an apartment. And um, you know, we had one family, they, they were it was just so, so remarkable family. They. Um, their, almost their whole family was wiped out in Haiti in the earthquake. So they ended up in Boston. Um, no, they ended up in Florida, and that's where the, the violence really escalated. The stress after the earthquake just really escalated, and this abuser just became really, really dangerous. The mother took her three kids um, to the airport in Miami, and the first plane that she could afford to get all of them on was to Boston. And then for Boston, she ended up here in Northampton. So she was an amazing cook. So she was cooking Caribbean food for everybody in the shelter while she was there. And um, the kids got settled in school, and um, the older kid graduated from high school here. And um, it took her probably five months to really find a place to relocate. But while she was in shelter, she went through an entrepreneurial uh, business planning class that we were able to offer with Verizon and decided she wanted to open a restaurant. And she opened a restaurant somewhere else because she really, she wanted to kind of be right here and open a, you know, a Caribbean restaurant, um, but couldn't find housing, couldn't find, couldn't afford the, you know, everything that it would take. And, you know, she learned about business planning, so she knew how to do that. So her restaurant now is in Southampton. Um, and so her kids, her kids um, who were still in school transferred. But it would have been so wonderful had she been able to, to mm -hmm. stay here and really kind of give back to the community. Sometimes now and then she kind of brings something in for, for us or, you know, kind of comes and visits her counselor. But it's folks like that that I can imagine would really... Um, and that's why a downtown location would be perfect also. Right. She didn't drive, you know, yeah, but or she could have gotten her kids on the bus to school. She could have, like, you know, opened a restaurant, had everything kind of right there. So. Um, yeah, so we really we see a lot of promise in that um, in that location, and it's a great match with the community-oriented nature of Northampton. You know, our many of our our um, community clients, especially 
just, you know, they had, except for the <coughs> violence that's happening at home, there were a lot of things that they really want to keep in place. And um, that would be a situation that would, uh, that would really help. And like, just like Councilor Klein from Ward 7 mm -hmm. had stated about the two projects, we do have two projects, HAP and Valley CDC mm -hmm. for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, HAP is a little bit larger as far as apartment wise is on that section. But as a city councilor, I cannot tell you how hard I'm working about Valley CDC. I had a meeting today in the planning department for two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. The emails that I have gotten, I cannot believe it. It's, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. Of, of people supporting against, it? No. no. I guess it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have to prove myself as a city councilor mm -hmm. of the importance. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is my job to go on site, take a look at what is happening there, talk with the butters, and also answer the questions that I'm being asked as a counselor with our professional staff. Mm -hmm. So it's not an easy one. This is mm -hmm. a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, you know, I mean, I wasn't at Safe Passage when we took on the, the site that we're at now with our shelter. But I do know that there were a lot of conversations with the butters. There were concerns about well, what would the neighbor, what would happen in the neighborhood if there was a exactly. violent shelter. Um, and it was really about sort of the forming relationships. And um, you know, we we have certainly there's issues like neighbors have issues with each other that now we address. But I think I think some of those things when people really begin to see the stories and really see the picture and hear what. Um, a little bit more, like get a picture of like the, the types of folks who, who would be there. I mean, I yeah, think that's that. that. Yeah, I've cool. had service net on my board, mm -hmm. Habitat, we've had tons of meetings out there over the development occurring there. Everything worked out fine mm -hmm. on that. We did have people put their houses up for sale and moved out. Mm -hmm. well, that's your choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an educational part. Right. right. Okay, and that's what it's all about. But when it comes to taxpayers' money, there's a huge, huge outcry in this city. You know, now we're spending more, more fees. Now we have two good projects that are occurring, and it's money. Yes, but it, I mean, it's it's money that is already in the fund, and it's one of the four things that you can spend that money on. But it's taxpayers' money on a CPA, and that's what they're looking at. Right, mm -hmm. right. But if you, I mean, just from our perspective, looking at people who've experienced domestic violence, getting back on their feet is all about their, about their community. So a community preservation yes. intention mm -hmm. feels perfect to me for, you know, I mean, something that is of that nature is, is a great match for, the, you know, what, our, what folks that we work with need every single day. Mm -hmm. so, so we're certainly happy to provide any additional information and perspective that might you know, that might help. You know, I would say by the same token that there's an outcry that you might be hearing, and there's also extraordinary support in the city, I think, for this. Well, I understand that. So mm -hmm. I think it kind of works both ways. Right, right. it is, yeah. and I understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's my job to work with my department heads and get the answers for the people who are having Absolutely. a problem with it. Right. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's hard work that, you know, that kind it of is. in many ways on all of you to, you know, to make it to, to sort of answer those questions and those concerns. And then you finally do what you have to do, yeah. get your answers, mm -hmm. and you make your decision on your answers of working with departments. Right, right. I do know, you know, it's, um, there, there are, are not many people who, you know, can sort of make a decision like, oh, at market rate, I, I'm just gonna, you know, move to Northampton. You know, my partner and I have not been able to get to that point. We live in Springfield right now. You know, and since you know, there's some the nice economy, places in Springfield. There are beautiful I places in Springfield, and I there. enjoy it. But I'm saying, if you know, I'm an executive director of an agency here, and there's not a lot that I can afford in Northampton. No, it's expensive. You know? <laughs> So, she, so she, you know, and so so everybody's situation is different, and is. you know, we realize you know realize that, and you know, we have we're we're in a lovely neighborhood where 
the you know the housing prices never recovered from the um, from the fall. And so I think sometimes there's a misperception on people's part about like what the you know sort of what the situations of the sort of of the residents or, or, or folks would be. And um, you know I think about our adult kids who are you know looking at apartments and things like that. That you know would they be able to get a job and, and live here? You know is there well, you know, our oldest is graduating college. That's why the minimum wage so, needs to go up. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, so we feel, feel well strongly about, about housing. Um, and I don't see a clock anywhere, so I don't know how much time I have left. But it looks like five it's minutes. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So <clears throat> just just few. Well, um, anyway, just do this. So thinking of City of Northampton as an employer where there potentially are survivors who work for <coughs> government you know, municipal offices, school department, police, and perpetrators. And so think, you know, helping you think through um, what those protocols might be, um, there's a lot of you know, safety concerns very often in a small mm -hmm. town where there's a lot of foot traffic and things. Right, right. And so um, all of those things are, are definitely worth maybe having some conversations about what kinds of precautions as an employer the city could be taking around, around domestic violence. Um, and in particular, there's a new law that um, that requires every employer to, um, you know, to allow for domestic violence leave if someone needs to attend court hearings or counseling, things like that. So we want to make sure that the um, the personal policies that govern sort of the day-to-day -day work of your employees are, are up to date and complies with that law. Um, and then, which way does this go? And then economic, you know, connections. Um, anything that we can do together to sort of boost employment opportunities. Um, thinking of domestic violence survivors also as consumers and as you know people who want to fully participate in, um, in this economy. Entrepreneurship is a perfect kind of job track for domestic violence survivors because it gives them the um, it gives them the flexibility that they might need to. Um, help adhere to a safety plan with their kids. You know, if someone can't pick up their kid at three o'clock in the afternoon because they have to work nine to five, it not just leaves an inconvenience, but it leaves room for that abuser to, uh, you know, to, to show up and to possibly harm or kidnap that child. And so safety plans sometimes need to be built around how, what people's work life needs to be. So owning a business, doing um, something that has that flexibility is a it's um, definitely helps people um, in terms of their recovery and getting back on their feet. So the, the combination of public safety and social service needs, and then the contribution to sort of the overall community prosperity. There's something like somebody who has kind of come through a hard time, and then that first holiday season or that first summer of sort of participating in a, in a community is um, yeah it's such a it's such a given, given a given a get between a community and survivors. So we like to think, you know, part of our economic work is really helping people fully participate in all of the the services that a community has to offer, but then also all of the uh, advancements of that community. So that's kind of overall what we have. Yeah, public forum. I don't know if we have any time for any questions or anything, but I'm certainly happy to. Uh, I know we've been doing a little bit of that as we went along. Did you already touch on sort of um, some of the exciting new things you've been able to do in say the past five years since the hot topic Um Yeah, I, I talked a little bit about this. There's a slide about some of the expansions right. we've had in programming and um, development of our prevention work um, and our children's advocacy program. If you've been on Facebook anywhere near Sarah Smith, you've heard about the children's program because that's just her. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, our legal program has been able to expand, our mental health work. Um, really yeah, yeah, it's really, I mean, the you know, the generosity of this community is like, no other, I mean, I'm sort of the envy of domestic violence program directors across the state. And everybody but, else. Mm -hmm. else. <laughs> <laughs> Every other organization. Yeah. So, but it's, you know, the, the people coming forward with, um, you know, their $10 to $1,000 checks that, that, come, that combine to uh, create that is really, um, we, we, we take that seriously and we don't take that lightly. So we're very careful with how we steward that money also. 
You um, talked about how many clients you serve, but what, what is the staff look like? We have um, 12 full-time staff, including two full-time staff who work in a shelter, and about 12 part-time staff, either anywhere from 25 or 8 hours a week, so up to 20 hours. Okay, we have about 30 volunteers. In organization. 30 yeah. volunteers. Yeah, at, at, at any kind of one time, sometimes it's a little bit lower. Well, thank you, and you all know too, so I just so appreciate this opportunity to keep you up to date, and really my, my cards are here. If there's ever any information you need or need someone to show up or there's some, thank you know, to, to add to your arguments, you're doing some really, really important work for people that often get sort of forgotten and neglected in the scheme of things, so thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. You're very welcome to come to City Council February 5th. We're doing two readings. Okay. Okay, on the affordable housing, mm -hmm. we've already done half, that one's taken care of. Right. The one on Valley CDC. Okay. So right. if you'd like to come in a public right. session, you have three minutes to speak. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. All right, we're planning on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Carol. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know what the procedure was. I'm filling in at the last minute for Natalia Munoz, yeah. um, who has a family. She's actually a female. I got an email from her. And she apologizes. And other people were working. And, uh, well, she flew out to Puerto Rico just a little while back, too, right. because of the illness. Right. And, but anyway, she has asked Carol to come in and Thank talk. You. Thank you. And talk Thank you. about Thank you. the Human Rights Commission. Yes. And what Which, of course, I'm very new at. So That's OK. I feel welcome. I had, there were others who had Brown come Carol, I want to introduce to my right is the city councilor from Ward 4, Gina Louise Sierra, and our city councilor, Marianne Burge, from Ward 6 in the chair. And to the left is Alyssa Klein, yeah, councilor from Ward 7. I'm just wondering if we can, probably for the camera, it's better. Um, yeah. Tag, would, would you be willing to look at the lights on back there? Thank you. Can okay, they get the back of it? Are you cable or? Uh, the back of your head is. Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> Don't have to worry about my look. It's, it's not, it's not live. It's make sure your hair looks nice and nice. Okay. Okay. Now, now that Natasha talked about the candidates for the Human Rights Commission, she wanted to talk about that. Well, there were three openings, and I have filled one of them, and next week will be my first meeting as an approved official. There was a process. Um, there are two openings. Um, we, uh, I've offered to help her, and we've been um, reaching out um, to try to fill them. There's no applications that are put in? At, at the moment, not. We've met with a number of people trying to get It's not easy to get people. Um, and we're, we're also trying to diversify as much as we can, this commission. But um, we reached out, and we thought we had one person. And uh, the woman you mentioned, Natalia, is getting in touch with her. Um, so it's going to be a big push, and I've offered to help make that something I'll work very hard on. I hope we get applications. the role of the Human Rights Commission in light of the city's new administrative code. So my understanding is that before the new code, um, the commission actually took complaints and investigated them, and that will no longer be the case. Mm -hmm. So now, 
the approach will be to look in to, to twofold. One is for commissioners to look into areas that we can offer some help, and the other is to put it out in the community and get the agenda more publicized, ask people to come and speak and bring up issues that they want the commission to work on. Um, <coughs> so that if we can, and then bring, bring to the council what our concerns are based on our investigation and our discussions. And so we have to be more proactive about dealing it with it as not as an individual crisis, but as a more of a systemic issue. Um, if you folks have input on that, that would be good. But that, that's more or less. I know when I had a meeting with the mayor and Natasha. Natalia. I mean, Natalia. Yeah. On, in regards to those concerns, and he had explained to her about the charter and so forth. Right. Um, I have some concerns about how you're going to actually get out there and let people know. Are you going to go on the radio and talk about the Human Rights Commission? I mean, how are you going to do That's a very good show yes. and the visibility? Given that this is a new year and a new charter, that is going to be on the agenda for the next year. How are we going to do that? Um, and who do we need to help us with that? Something to say on that? Would you write any suggestions on that? About how to get the word out about what the role of the Human Rights Commission is? For them to let people know. To come and bring concerns. I mean, one thought I had that we'll, I mean, that we should discuss is we probably should be doing some public information programming on what human rights are. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think everybody knows what that means. And we can hold forums in schools and talk about what are people's human rights and what is it that they should expect of their municipality um, in terms of human rights. We might bring somebody to speak about that. Well, one of the things that actually came up um, in public comment at the last meeting that Natalia suggested was some kind of commission that will just Oh, that's that's next on the agenda. But that's I was three thinking of that as actually a vehicle. You know, if you did that before even getting the word out, in a sense, I mean, you'd have to get the word out to have people come. But to talk about that as a role that the, I mean, this has to be worked through all kinds of channels. But having a commission like that um, be publicized, I think it would be kind of a an interesting. Um, kind of trigger for all kinds of public relations movement so that people would know more about the Human Rights Commission more broadly than just a commission. Not a com yeah. I, I'm not, I'm talking about as a commission, but some kind of process by which the Human Rights Commission could serve as a sounding board for community input, complaints, questions, issues, identifying um, human rights, potential human rights violations, so whatever the mechanism is that is determined, that in and of itself, I think, can just be a good public relations kind of trigger to get the word out about what the Human Rights Commission does. Mm -hmm. But I would also um, I would also suggest looking at what um, Northampton Cable TV can do for you and CTV. So we could go on community TV. We could go on and speak. Yeah. Some kind of programming, yeah. I think, would be a really good way. I was also thinking about that. PTOs. I think we should make the round of the PTOs and talk there. I think there are certain key organizations, and actually Marianne can serve as a really good resource because she knows all the social service organizations in the Valley, but just to look at them and contact their directors and work with them and see what their clientele, you know, how they can the kind of communications they have with their clientele that can convey the word too. But very could be a full time job for somebody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, they said sort of too well. when I talked with Natalia about the Human Rights yeah. Commission, yeah. our Commission on Disabilities yes. okay, is extremely important. Absolutely. Extremely about doing a round table with the Commission on Disabilities and the Human Rights Commission because there's really things that are being brought up That's now. a really interesting idea. This it's a very important yes. The Americans with Disability Act 
has been, be, you know, because it hasn't really been criminalized. Right. It's, it's very important. Um, so I think that's talked, so exciting, yes. Yeah, we talked about it yesterday at our meeting, and also I'm going to call District Attorney Dave Sullivan's office mm -hmm. and get him scheduled to come to the Commission on Disabilities because there is concerns right now of, oh my God, I'm just thinking about people who have disabilities trying to get around this city. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it's skating right now there. Of having him come yeah. because it's being brought to our attention that people who have personal care of tenants taking care of their needs, that there is some serious abuse going on with that. And so that's why I want the Human Rights Commission, which I did tell Natasha that, mm -hmm. of coming in on a round table and listen to the concerns of that. And also the district attorney's office and have him there, definitely. And also get an attorney who I know who deals with abuse on those cases through the district attorney's mm -hmm. office to be there also. Mm -hmm. So I think once we do that, <coughs> we should have that round table with the Human Rights Commission, mm -hmm. okay, and the Commission on Disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you what you just said about on the outside area of, of problems and so forth. There's a lot of issues. Yeah. You know, I mean, you want to get into the nitty gritty, you're talking about your civil rights, your rights to speak, okay? Right. I mean, it's huge out there. Your rights to your religion, your abuse to your religion, yeah. I mean, being harassed about no matter what color <coughs> you are, right. there's a lot involved. Well, and, and like we saw in city council meetings, mentally ill people and then on the street, so of course. And then there's a question of people's rights to care. Um, that's it. I mean, one of the things that uh, Carol Reinhardt sent me an email today to bring up, but can we move to item three? Because we are now, in fact, yours was a segue to what we're going to do this year. And one of the things Carol uh, mentioned that they started last year, but we want to push on this year, is finding a way for people who don't speak English to have translators, whether it's in legal situations. But as Carol mentioned, they did work at Cooley Dick. Mm -hmm. um, somebody comes into the emergency room, and it's a, you know. Casa it, Latina has a grant, I think, to provide translation at the hospital. Who does? Casa Latina. Uh-huh. So I mean, one of the things we, I mean, in terms of our new role, one of the things may be that we have oversight to see where are the gaps. Is there a grant? Are there things being filled? If things are not being filled and there isn't a grant, who do we talk to to see whether we can find a way? You know, we're, we're an unfunded commission, but at least we can try to find out and report to city council what's going on and what the needs are. Um, and you're correct about that because a friend of mine who's Greek Orthodox like I am, is an attorney in Northampton, and has a client who just strictly speaks Greek. Mm -hmm. okay. So she had asked me about who I knew could come into her office so that they, you know, could, she, that once they spoke, that it would be translated to her as an attorney, because she is Greek, but we've all forgotten our language ever since I was a little girl. That's all I spoke was Greek and Portuguese. Really? Yes. Wow. Okay. And then once families passed away, yeah. it kind of like goes out the door. Yeah. But anyways, I had that experience also. I, I do have some language. people on my ward who do speak Greek. Really? So yeah. hopefully, yeah. Greek so hopefully we're going to get some help there because they need to be represented and we need to get yeah. a translator in there. So it is a big issue. Well, I just, I don't know about, I, I, one of the things I don't know would love to learn is what are the actual ethnic demographics of Northampton. But I just picked up my grandson from school in East Hampton and as I saw the kids tumbling out of this little cage before school, mm -hmm. it really looked international. 
there are, is obviously a lot of immigrants um, in East Hampton. I agree about that. And I don't know if that's true in Northampton um, or not. Are there somebody must have statistics? Census is always behind. Yeah, I don't know if we have demographic. I have heard them in the past. Um, I don't know. Again, yeah, do you know anything about that from the city clerk's office? No, I don't know. Best place to get it is from principals because they have a sense of what's in their schools at any given time. Wouldn't yeah, um, planning and sustainability have some level on some mm -hmm. information on demographics? I'm going to ask why I know the How about Pat Keller might. I think she left. Coach. Anyway, because one of the things we're going to have to assess is what are what are the language needs. Um, I mean, our Spanish is obvious that, that that's a no-brainer. But mm -hmm. now over in East Hampton, there's a Cambodian community. Um, I think there's some Bangladesh people. Of course, those people will be coming to Kobe Dick. Mm -hmm. Like even on my ward, I only had one, one couple that was great. Now it's more and more and more Portuguese. So people are moving here. Yeah, Greek and Portuguese. How fascinating. Is there anything on the city website, Pam? Is that what you're checking? I'm trying to check it, but I don't have access. I'm not connected here. Hmm. Those statistics do exist, though. I know they do. I just don't what else did I have about what we're going to do? So we're working on this new. Um, The advisory commission, the new commission <coughs> that would include the different constituencies. And as you say, we would be a sounding board to bring things. So it's not a new commission per se, it's just a function. It'll be, you're hoping to create this as some kind of function. Well, this was Natalia's idea. She, she wanted a, a special commission that included representatives from the police, from the DA, and people who work with communities of color. But it wasn't off the top of the head idea. We are going to be discussing it at our next meeting. And it did come about in the, in the aftermath of, of all that happened with the demonstration. Mm -hmm. And that wonderful, I thought the panel was wonderful. Um, oh, I did too. I think it, it created hearing all the different ideas from, and seeing all the con different constituencies together. And, and for me, then seeing Vanessa go up and talk to the, to the chief of police, and the two of them uh, having a conversation and, and agreeing to meet. I don't know if you knew that, but um, yeah. uh, hearing people from different age groups. I don't know, I think, it defused some of the uh, maybe tension about the subject and showed that people can sort of talk about it without agreeing with seeing different points of view, but still being able to come together in a room and talk, and that there's obviously more work to be done. Um, so I feel like our commission benefited from that, and that we can pick up where that left off and a place for that um, to go on. So it's kind of exciting, actually. When and where do you guys meet? Well, believe it or not, the next meeting is going to be in the community room of the police department. Now, the, traditionally, the publicity for it has just been on the website, but I feel like we need to find other ways. On the radio, NCTV, I agree. Okay, so NCTV, I don't know who, who watch, do you think people watch it, and when is the best? Some, not, I mean, I think if you're trying to reach certain communities, it's not good. They're not going to be reached through NCTV. And they will be reached more through public service announcements <coughs> on the radio, so we could write a PSA. I think a, yeah. a press release would be really useful to send yeah. to the, all the local newspapers, radio stations. And if Natalia should know how to do that, I would have Well, I know how to do that. I'm a former oh, you, professional. Oh, okay. I'm a former journalist. Of course journalist. you are. I'm sorry. So, so the press but release. Do you have press um, lists and things like that? 
uh, for local yeah. press lists? Okay. Yeah. And what okay. I don't have, I'll get from Jeff Napolitano. Okay. I helped Joe Comerford get her current and since then they've kept it up, but I can certainly, um, I mean, I think he's a, a logical ally of the Human Rights Commission. And uh, they have student interns and they update it because news directors change and deadlines change and they just keep it in the computer. So, um, so you're suggesting we send a press release out in advance of every meeting to remind people of the meeting? Sure. Is that what you're suggesting? How often do you meet? Once a month? Once a month. So you said the next meeting is in the community room at the police station, and when is it? Um, I don't know, I can't remember. 20, 20. It's in January. I think it's the 28th. It's a what day of the week is the 28th? That's a Wednesday, so I think it is on it's that day. It's either Wednesday or Thursday. I think it's a Wednesday. Is that a Wednesday? Okay. What time? Seven. Oh. She tries to keep the meeting short. I'd love to be there, but I can't. I already have a Democratic meeting time. But you're not sure if it's the 28th or 29th. I don't think it's not the 28th. Gonna, I think it's not on the city website. I mean, it's not the 29th. I think it's the 28th. Okay. And it should be in the city yes. website now. Mm -hmm. um, um, do you know the week? 22nd. It's the 28th. That's tomorrow. It's not the 28th. It says the 28th is on a Wednesday. Right. It, on, on the website, it says January 22nd. Well, I don't know why. And then there's one at February, February 26th. That's weird. Is there an agenda attached to it? Are you sure it's not tomorrow night? I know it's not tomorrow night. And there's a mistake on the city website. Hmm. Um, there is an agenda attached, and it's for January 22nd at 7 p.m. Oh, wait. 2014. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure because I'm pretty sure it's a 28. The 28. The 28 is it's not. It's not. Um, That's not on there. So with her gone, how do I make sure it gets on there? There are no years on this. Well, I'll yeah. ask when. I mean, I'll ask some people years. that are just, my seniors on. Um, there. I'm sorry. You know, there should be an January 28th. It is January 28th. It's on there. It is on. It there. uh, it puts them in, in yeah. reverse. Yeah, but it doesn't order. say it's in the police community room. It does. It says community room at the police station. Oh, then she took care of that. Okay, good. And there was a problem about that because you had to, you were having difficulties trying to access them to City Hall. Oh, you know, I, I was the one that blew the whistle on that. I was horrified. So I'm invited to come, and there was a woman who wanted to come, and she couldn't climb those stairs back there. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that there's a door that has an elevator, but yes. it's locked. After five. So I had to call ahead to the mayor's office and have somebody come down and bring her up. And uh, there's also a problem about the bathroom. Have you verified that the police, the community room, the police station has, is accessible? She because has, but there are parts of that building that aren't. Well, I went down there today because I decided to take that Citizen Police Academy thing, and I, which the chief told me about and, uh, at the meeting. And I um, brought my application, and, and while I was there, I asked, where's the community room? And she says, you just come, the police station's open after five, and she says, you just come in and go into that room. It's right on the main floor. So, um, but I... I mean, speaking of accessibility and human rights, mm -hmm. it, I noticed when we had the zone, oh, it was the zoning meeting, not human rights. We were having a bunch of meetings about, you know, Ward 3 and Ward 4 and yeah. Pomeroy terrorists and all mm -hmm. those issues. And when I came here, um, I saw that people couldn't get upstairs without the elevator. Oh, yeah. They had to make a special plan. Mm -hmm. But that means that you have to know in advance it means that somebody who wants an elevator <coughs> has to know to call the mayor's office to make an arrangement. It doesn't, that's not good. Because the elevator wasn't operational? No. Was the doors door locked. locked. In, in City Hall? Yes. The doors that, to the elevator room? Mm -hmm. Or no, getting in. You the can't, when you come in, when you come in the back door, the door the back right, the back and not only that, if, if you're not an insider and you don't know, 
to come to even the back door. If someone says to you, there's a meeting about this issue in City Hall, and you'll go to the front door of City Hall and it's locked. Mm -hmm. There's no sign that says, so, I mean, these are issues. Yeah, those were brought up to the mayor. With these are issues, the not just of physical accessibility, but <coughs> community participation in the civic process. Now, it's an old building, I understand, but maybe there's... Just sign the table. <coughs> Languages, maybe. Yeah, a couple of well, buzzer. A couple of me in. That rings on all the floors. Yeah. People will be ringing it all day. Well, no, it might make sense maybe. that for every meeting, there's a sign, somebody makes it their business, staff here makes it their business when they lock the front door to put a sign that says that access or X, Y, or Z meeting what about come this around room? to the back. Why wouldn't the Human Rights Commission be able to use this room? Because it's accessible. It is, when you're not having meetings here. It's kind of a weird shape, but, but is this door unlocked? This door yeah, locked? You have to reserve it. Yeah. You have to reserve the room. Another possibility for a room. It certainly beats having to go up those steps, and it makes it an accessible room for anybody that wants to come. At the police station, because of the handicapped accessibility there, plus the parking. I think well, it's I just might I'm 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 holding, Am I holding this gentleman up by expanding? He's the other five thirty. Oh, we have till five thirty. Okay. You know, the, but I'm just concerned that the police station might be off-putting to some people that might want to come to a meeting. Yes. Well, and that we raises a whole from, other issue that I was going to bring up with the commission, but I could mention it here. So if a human right is the right to assemble, then the idea of having a public space where groups can go and meet, like Amherst has the bank center, and you can sign up a room, we don't have anything like that. Now, I understand that I'm opening up a Pandora's box to ask why a room at the senior center couldn't be considered a community center room. In the evening, that building is usually not used, but the person that directs it makes it difficult and complicated to figure out how to use it. Um, you mean the community room where we have our commission meetings? You're not talking about the big, large room because we do what have should be? we have ours on um, commission on disabilities. Do you meet at the senior center? Yes. In that big room? No. It's another one. It's off to the side door, and it's to the left. Is it a couches? Is it a couches? Yeah, but yeah. it has tables set up like this. Yeah. Well, a space there for groups yeah. to meet. Well, what's the difficulties? I don't understand it. To meet in the evening. Well, if they, do money, have, they do have an organization that comes in on Tuesdays in the evenings, but I think, I'm not sure if they pay for that rental. I don't know. I'm going to explore it. But I talked to Pat Shaughness. I just, NCTV has a community room that you can use without cost the library, which is a problem right now because there's there are accessibility issues, but that should be solved in the coming months. Yes, they have a community room. That Lily can be Library used. has a community Lily room. Library has a great community room. It's often booked, but if you book ahead of time for many months, that's a really good accessible space. You know, Frances Crow was looking for a place to hold her films. Um, yeah, because MEF no longer yeah. uses it, offers their room. That's right. true. No. You don't have to pay for using a room at the police station. You also have the fire station with their community room, too. Do they? Yes, and the fire chief, Brian Duggan, he's been excellent about using that room if it's available. We should go visit all these community rooms. <coughs> but I'll also talk to Pat Shaughnessy about Yeah, it. I think you should. I and mean, that's a nice space. Don't forget about this space, too. Yeah, yeah right. I think this would be a really nice space to have the Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. I do too. Yeah, but who do people talk to if they want to try and schedule something in this space? So is this one of the city council hearing room? Is this city council chamber? Um, yes, city council. Is council. responsible for the facilities per se. And they I, do reservations I don't know that they the actually space. do the booking. I mean, who books, who books their meetings on the city calendar? Is that through the mayor's office? 
we should, I should know this. Ms. Oppenheim, is that, the, is that through the mayor's office that the that the committee meetings get posted? Do you know? Oh, you were speaking to me. You know, I don't know. As I say, I'm new, and I know Natalia deals with that. Right. We used to. I know Mary Medora used to go through. I think David Pomerantz's department, and she used to deal with the secretary. So you think, should call. Yeah, or Mary just check with the mayor's office and ask yeah. them. Yeah. Right. If the yeah. mayor's office is the one that's booking it, then they're the ones that are reserving the facility space. Okay. So for this room. They would book it like for this room or yeah. the police station for that matter. Oh really? Not the police department? Well we have an online facilities module that books locations throughout the city. Oh. Um, you know, the public spaces. I'm gonna call the mayor's office tomorrow and find out about that. Who actually booked? Because I know Mary booked us through our all our city councils. I do, yeah, I do that for for you for the facilities, um, but it's whoever books the actual meeting itself. So if it's for the human rights, if it's the mayor's office, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, for all the council stuff though, I book the meeting rooms and you know whatever. If I could have access to um, the internet, I could look this stuff up. <laughs> you can't get on the Wi-Fi? You know, it's kind of funny. I'm not set up as an administrator on my own computer <laughs> to allow myself to do that. We want to thank you. Oh, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm enthusiastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Taking on that responsibility yeah. of co-chairing that commission. It's very exciting. What, co-chairing? You're not co-chairing? <laughs> That commission? I thought you and Natalia were co-chairs. Of the Human Rights Commission? Yeah. That's yet to be determined. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't I have misinformation then. No, no, I'm just helping her out. I don't think she'll have a co-chair. I think she needs an assistant, though. And we'll see if anyone who's got seniority over me volunteers to be that assistant. Um, I mean, she definitely needs it, and I'm urging her to ask somebody, but there are Everybody on the commission is seniority over me, and I, I don't want to walk in and because I've been friendly with her. I, I, you know, so we'll see. But but they all work, I think. I think I'm the only retired person, so. You might be very happy to have you do that. Yeah, I think. Thank you for coming and pinch hitting for her, and please give her our condolences. I will. I will. Apparently, the one who died is a very close cousin that's sort mm -hmm. of like a sister. When's she coming back? And she's only in her 60s, the woman who died. When is she coming back? I don't know. Probably later this week. Um, Sad. Yeah. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Thank you. Lovely to see women running the city. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. I wouldn't exactly say we're running the city. Well, I'm joking. In this room. Remember? Oh, we do have a gentleman here. Hi. You're Jesse. Well, Mike. we're over to get to uh, oh, yeah. public Sorry. comment. Yeah. Councilor, we're opening this to public comment. If you want to see it, we need to recognize Councilor Adams. Oh, I see you're not on the. Thank you. Where are you? Where are you on the agenda? Oh, we're at public comment and then we're doing vibrant sidewalks. Okay. Um, I want to speak to vibrant sidewalks. Just two things. The first, the first thing is um, I hope it gets moved. I urge you to move it forward tonight. Um, if it gets moved forward tonight, then we'll be taking a vote on it in February, and that'll be just a few months short of two years we've been working on this. And I think good process is important. I think we've had a good process, um, and a lot of it. But I think we're probably past that point this time. I think at this point we're reaching overkill. And the other point I wanted to make was that um, since the resolution was first drafted, I think three important things have happened that have, that have or will impact this business community. Um, last November was the final challenge, unsuccessful, to casinos. So we know that we'll have casinos for certain, um, especially including one here in Western Massachusetts. And even more, um, with, with more local and immediate impact, I think, um, since, since the resolution started, the discussion began, um, the Business Improvement District was found to be illegal and stricken, uh, struck down by the courts entirely, and 
very recently we've seen a couple of major downtown retailers close. And I like maybe others have heard rumors about other rep rest restaurants, for example, and possibly other businesses in extreme jeopardy. So I'm one of the original sponsors. I support the resolution entirely. But I also think that some, if not many, or possibly a majority of business owners in the community had issues with the resolution. And I think now, going forward, it looks particularly insensitive at this point with these things that have occurred um, to, to put forward a resolution that, to some, um, doesn't look pretty, doesn't look too supportive of businesses. I disagree with that. I don't think it's anti-business, but some do. And it's important to take that into consideration. Um, so, again, I think at this point, the fact that we're voting on it after these things have occurred, we are on the risk of lo looking particularly insensitive to the business community and oblivious to their anxieties, and in some cases, extreme anxieties about downtown, which possibly is in a more difficult position than it has been in decades. So I just wanted to bring that to this committee's attention. Um, those are, that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, can I ask a question? Do you have, do you have some suggestions? Because yeah, I was just sitting here thinking about it. I, Bef before you answer that, though, can I just yeah. say that we did, um, I, you, I should have uh, sent you the resolution rewritten based on our deliberations last meeting. And we did take into account, we had a number of people come to the public comment sessions that talked about exactly what you're talking about, their business owners and what their concerns were. So there's not a lot of language added, but there is a sentence added that really talks about making sure that there's unfettered access to all estab uh, commercial establishments, something along those lines. So just so you know that that's in there now, and we'll also read it when we get into the actual discussion, but just so you know that before you respond to um, Councilor Shiraz. Okay, thank you. Um, could you point out where that is, please? Yeah, I just saw that. Right here. It's on the second page, Councilor, and it's one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph down. Fourth. I'm oh, sorry. okay. Great. Thank you. You're Under welcome. which? What's the section called? I just worked on this. I should know this. So now under. These are the where. I think it's under the where as. Where as, as the where owners. Yes. I. Uh, do you have the right one? I do. Whereas business owners and customers are interested in unfettered access to commercial establishments along our sidewalks. The right. Mm -hmm. uh, I I would just you know. This is a suggestion. Um, add something that would make it even more uh, overtly supportive of businesses without detracting from it. And I just, I can read you the language I wrote here while I was sitting here, just for consideration. Whereas the Northampton City Council supports the Northampton business community and believes that vibrant democratic sidewalks and public spaces can enhance the experience of visitors to Northampton and is a benefit to the Northampton business community. And I wrote that because um, I think in thinking of what we have to offer with, for example, casinos, one of the things we have to offer is, I think, vibrant democratic sidewalks and public spaces because that's something that casinos don't really have to offer. And, um, and it's, uh, in that way, it's a benefit. I think that um, the uniqueness of downtown has always drawn people there, and you know, to an extent. So, I hope this goes forward tonight, no matter what. Um, and if there are any further amendments that needs that are, that are proposed, it can be done at the full council. But um, again, I think that it just it just comes across as particularly. Um, it could make the council look particularly oblivious and insensitive to the concerns of the business community particularly now, and um, not all perceptions are something we should act on, but that one is possibly one that we should act on. Thank you. Could you just read that again, please? Well, I wonder, can you, is there any chance you can send it to me right now, and I'll put it into the draft that yeah, we have sure. here, so when we discuss it, we can read it. 
This is all the amendments are in this document that I proposed. It'll be the last one that is in this document. The one that you sent us a couple months ago. Right. Okay, so I worked all of those into the, what we're looking at today. So I'll just pull that one out. Okay, great. Thank you. It's sent. Yes, it's the last one. This is the new language that we are considering bringing to the council. Right. So it's and it's quite different, actually. It is. So that's why we have to kind of really look at it, and make sure that we're all we okay. all feel comfortable with the new language. Okay. And then, of course, since we have Councillor Adams here, he could chime in too if, about the changes we've made if he's interested. All right. Thank you. Yes. So how do you want to do it? Read it. And yeah, I think we should read it. Yeah. Um, do you want to sure. read it? Do you want to read it? Yeah, you, you may. You can go ahead. <laughs> All right. Whereas urban planning professors Anastasia Luca and Renya Aaron Fucht, Fucht, Aaron Fucht, uh, identify five essential purposes of sidewalks in their compelling article: vibrant sidewalks in the United States reintegrating walking and quintessential social realm. So that one hasn't changed, the opening. Okay. Whereas these essential purposes can be described as follows, hasn't changed. This one has changed. Movement. Sidewalks facilitate the movement of people from one place to another and should afford us unfettered access to venues and locations, commercial, formal, and informal, that we wish to enter. So this has changed because, first of all, we, we spoke about movement of people as opposed to pedestrians, so it would be more inclusive of people who aren't necessarily walking. Um, and we added here something about the unfettered access to venues and locations, commercial, formal, and informal, that we wish to enter. Do we want to go through the whole thing, or should we do it, or do we want to do it paragraph by paragraph? Um, you mean, should, do we want to, I mean, I think just if there's something we want to say about the paragraph or change, maybe we should do it then, but. Okay, so is there anything with that one that people want to comment on? Does it no. need adjustment? Councillor Adams, do you have any input into that? No. And so the unfettered access was um, sort of in, in response to, you know, or sort of acknowledgement of uh, people should, you know, People have a right to assemble, of course, and to do what they, they'd like to do on the sidewalk, but other people also need to be able to access wherever they'd like to go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's also, reason, also, sorry, go ahead. It's also good because if it were to be construed that people could, you know, block the sidewalks in exercising their free speech, well, that's actually legal on ordinance as well. So. Right, and we had talked, the reason that we have the kind of formal and informal is we wanted to 
um, we want it to be with regard to parks, to public buildings, not just businesses. So that's why there's that language. Okay, so the next paragraph, encounter. And this is based um, in part on uh, <coughs> Councillor Adams' suggestions of uh, changing confrontation. We're now yes. calling it encounter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sidewalks are the places where we congregate and meet people, people we know, people we don't know, and people we may not want to know. That's all the same. And sometimes this purpose of the sidewalk trumps the movement purpose, as in when a street fair temporarily closes a pathway to normal traffic. Sidewalks are where, quote, spontaneous and uh, planned festivities break the rhythm of everyday life and give collective expression to people's joys and sorrows and aspirations. That's all the same if my, my recollection is correct. Mm -hmm. And that quote is from? From that article. From yes. Any comments on that one? All right. Expression. Free speech, assembly, and expression must be accommodated in public, even if some consider these activities disruptive, uncomfortable, or confrontational. Discussion, debates, disagreements, protests, rallies, and sit-ins are all forms of expression that take place on democratic sidewalks. Under Article 16 of Part 1 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it is stated that, quote, the right of free speech shall not be abridged, unquote. So the only thing we changed here is we added that last sentence about Article 16, which I did look up and make sure I quoted um, accurately. Um, and that was a suggestion that came out of our public hearings from um, Attorney Newman. Yes. Councilor Adams, do you have any input there? Survival. Um, there's a change here, too, based on the recommendation of Councillor Adams. Survival. For some people, the sidewalk is home and the only place where they can carry out ordinary activities of daily life. Sidewalks are also, often controversially, the places where some people go to earn a living. Um, here we eliminated the examples of people who make a living on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there wasn't there one other change here. <coughs> Councilor Adams, did you have a change in that one, or am I mis... I think um, we took out um, what the activities of daily life are, but that was done before with the first one of the draft. Right, that's right. Um, beauty. Sidewalks can be a place of lush beauty with trees, plants, street furniture, art, and other items that give the sidewalk and the community it serves its own identity. I believe that's the same. We had talked about um, changing the word to vibrancy, and having beauty is one of those. And the reason that I didn't actually follow through with that is because I realized it didn't make sense because all of these are about vibrancy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so that remained the same, and I hope that's okay. If it's not, I can certainly change it. All right. Um, so now we're onto the whereas. -es. Whereas, and these aren't changed. Do I, should I read them if we haven't changed them? Um, well, we have a, another member of the public, so sure. Okay. Whereas the 2011 Nelson Nygaard design charrette focused on downtown Northampton, called for sidewalks markedly widened and Main Street narrowed to shorten crosswalks, increase safety, increase public space for foot traffic in front of local businesses, and provide an opportunity for more benches. And whereas in 2005 a study entitled, oh, I should say entitled, I'm sorry, it's entitled. <coughs> Uh, Northampton Streetscape Improvement Plan, Main Street and Pleasant Street were prepared, was prepared by Denning Design Associates Inc. and called for, in addition to improving and widening sidewalks, increasing seating along Main Street and Pleasant Street. So those have remained the same. Does anyone have any comment on either of those? Nope. They've been consistent nope. since the beginning. Whereas people are more likely to walk in areas that host a diversity of uses, also has remained the same. Whereas the sound infrastructure and ongoing upkeep of sidewalks and crosswalks keep them safer and navigable to all. And so that's new, and that is based on a lot of feedback we got in public hearings about making sure that the sidewalks were kept up. Mm -hmm. I had a little bit of hesitation following through on our adding that just because um, I think that because of ADA and other things, it's already a valid, it's, it's, yeah. it's in law mm -hmm. in the city. So I'm not sure. Should we take it out then? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I wanted to discuss that. What do you guys think? And as an attorney, I'm wondering, Councilor Adams, if you have any ideas about that one. I, I mean, 
no legal issues. I think I think that it's responsive to to those people, including Mr. Nagy, uh, who were talking about um, the disabled having um, infrastructure that can accommodate them. Right, and Devin Bruce also talked a lot about the um, sound infrastructure. So both hearings, and there are other places where we talk about things that are are you know a law. Right. Yeah. Um, whereas business owners and customers are interested in unfettered access to commercial establishments along our sidewalks. So now, right below that, we have the suggestion by Councillor Adams, so I'll read that again. Whereas the Northampton City Council supports the Northampton business community and believes that vibrant democratic sidewalks and public spaces can enhance the experience of visitors to Northampton and is a, and is a benefit to the Northampton business community, So I'm feeling like maybe more. a hybrid of those two mm -hmm. might be, I, and I think that's a good point talking yes. about Florence because, you and know, and I realized talk. after I sent this to you that um, I didn't, earlier than down at the bottom, I didn't mention downtown Florence. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had talked about kind of opening with something that talked about downtown, but we didn't have anything that opens with downtown in Northampton, so I didn't really know where naturally to put that. But that's a really good point that that should be here. So what do you two think um, of doing some kind of hybrid language of what we have about unfettered access again, along with what Councillor Adams is suggesting? think there's a way we could blend those to hit both the points because I think they are some different points mm -hmm. right but we do talk about unfettered access earlier on as well so um, Councillor Adams I'm just wondering you capitalize Northampton business community as if it's an entity um, is that the case I don't know of anything called Northampton Business Community. No. It's, okay. If that can be changed, it's not necessary. It's not really How anything. It's something I don't know about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess I would say I would put Councillor Adams first, and then so we have to put I mean, they're separate, but they go together, but I think that his sort of frames it. Right. Yeah. But we have to put, whereas the Northampton City Council supports the Northampton and Florence business community. Sure. Whereas the Northampton City Council supports the Northampton and Florence business communities. Is that something? Okay. Yeah. And believes that vibrant democratic sidewalks and public spaces can enhance the experience of visitors to Northampton and Florence. And is a benefit. And are a benefit to what do you what are you talking about there? That the sidewalks are a benefit to the communities? Sidewalks and public spaces. Vibrant democratic sidewalks? Is that what you're and public space, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, so it should be R. That's the first thing. Or oh, right, right, plural, right. correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And believes that vibrant democratic sidewalks and public spaces can enhance and are a benefit to the Northampton and Florence. I think the language is a little clunky. I think the idea is really good, but I think we have to figure out how to shorten it here. I think we're saying too much more there than Florence. Yeah, exactly. Well, Anybody good at wordsmithing on the spot? Um, so what if we said, uh, believes that vibrant democratic sidewalks and public spaces can enhance the experience of visitors to, um, we just say, we could just have commercial visitors areas? Or down, the downtowns, or, or do you even need to say enhance the visitor, experience of visitors? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wait. So say that again. Sorry. So just take just um, enhance the experience of visitors. Okay. And 
and how do we add in that business owners and customers are interested in unfettered access? Should we do it as a separate warehouse or should we fold it in here? Uh, what if we said and how about we put it right above it and then end it off with that? Um, no. Um, I mean, you could go from the general to the specific, right. and and keep the paragraph that was just amended, um, and then put the unfettered access paragraph after, yeah. going more specific. But I do I I wonder if. If both of those together fit there, really, I mean, I guess they well, that, yeah, it just changes the way it, it um, structured, sort of organized. Um, why don't we just keep it here? And that very worst that one little yeah. little paragraph. I'm pretty sure we'd be able to fit it in into the Council of Adams paragraph by removing City Council supports the Northampton and Florence community. Northampton business. Northampton and wishes to provide unfettered access, something like that. I mean, so at the end of what you have there, if so you, you, if you want, you could just. I mean, it kind of it loses some of what it's intended to do. But if you want, you could just simply say, whereas the Northampton City Council supports the Northampton and Florence business communities and customers are interested in unfettered access, but then, I mean, then you lose the rest of what it's supposed to yeah, do. Yeah, I think that's good what you have and believes that vibrant, how about this, and believes that vibrant domestic sidewalks and public spaces can enhance the experience of visitors and wish it, uh, wishes to provide owners and customers unfettered access to commercial establishments, establishments yeah. along our yeah. sidewalks. Mm -hmm. I, I think that might be worse. Mm -hmm. So a comma after visitors and wishes to provide unfettered access to commercial establishments along our sidewalks. Nice job. Um, almost done here. So this is another one that we added in based on comments that we got during public comment. Whereas trees enliven the sidewalks, purify the air, control erosion of topsoil, and provide shade and beauty for those traversing, gathering, and lingering on the sidewalks. And that's going to be addressed in the layer four. Do we want to go into that level of discussion of what trees do here? I mean, I personally like it, but I I did some um, creation of language. <coughs> Whereas street furniture allows for a city to be more of a community and area to gather, share, and experience life together. I think that's from the original language. Mm -hmm. Whereas benches provide pedestrians with an opportunity to sit and rest, wait for a bus where there is an adequate bus shelter space, meet a friend, or read the paper. And there should be an and. Or is there no and before the now therefore be resolved? Is that why there's not an and there? Someone who's written these? All right. Now, therefore, be a resolve that the Northampton City Council envision sidewalks as spaces that can accommodate a variety of activities and calls for the city to honor both the spirit and language of this resolution by, without limiting the generality of the foregoing, this is language that Councillor Adams added in recently, installing or placing additional street slash sidewalk furniture along the entire length of main streets in downtown Northampton and downtown Florence, as well as along other commercial uh, streets in the city, ensuring access to commercial establishments along our sidewalks, ensuring upkeep of sidewalks and crosswalks to allow for universal access, 
encouraging the creation of art walk on our sidewalks. That was something we added based on public comment. Mm -hmm. And increasing the number of shade trees on our downtown and commercial streets throughout the city. That is one mouthful. Okay. And it's six o'clock. I could just add one thing. Yes. It actually should be a, a colon where there's a comma at the end of the final whereas. Okay. Or a so simple, right? After paper. Right. Sorry, I'm blanking out here. Where <coughs> um, the, actually, what you were asking about, about why there's no and. So he's saying after, or read the paper. Oh, oh. Okay. There should be a colon. Great. Okay. It should be a colon, but no and? Right. Or there should be an and? No and. No and. Just a colon. Okay. So this last semicolon. paragraph is semicolon. Semicolon, not colon? Semicolon. All right. This last paragraph is kind of. Um, trying to encompass everything and I'm wondering about the what you think about the language and is there a better way to say any of this, all of it? Is there anything we need not to have here? Is there anything missing? I think we're saying a lot. I mean, but, you know, um, but I'm okay with it. I am. Let's see what the rest of has to say. Certainly sort of broadened it a bit. If you like it, I have no objections to it. But, um, Attorney Newman and I, well, he gave me sort of basis for it and I made some changes. The only thing that stuck out to me, I don't mind, but I don't know if others do. When you say, when you have language that, like, you know, by without limiting the generality of the foregoing, et cetera, it might sound too legalese like mm -hmm. for people. You're you know, the one who put it there. I know. <laughs> I know, but I mean, if, if non lawyers read, you know, if non lawyers find that obnoxious or unnecessary, that can be slashed easily. I don't even really know what it means to tell you the truth. I just put it there because you made the suggestion. It seems um, burdensome and unnecessary to me personally, but I thought maybe there was some legal reason it should be there. Maybe where is it? It's the like third line of the last paragraph. Uh, I mean, oh, I mean, that, that line just means, I mean, it isn't really that necessary. It just means, you know, Right. Without putting any limitation on everything we've said to this point, right? Which is kind of yeah. So, so it, it would instead read and calls for the city to honor both the spirit and language of this resolution, and then we would cut out by without limiting the generality of the foregoing. So it would just be oh, we don't get rid of by. Right. So it would say and language of this resolution by installing or placing additional street, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You just could cut out from. The comma after by to the comma after foregoing. So. Mm -hmm. By installing or placing additional street sidewalk furniture along the length of main streets in downtown Rancino and downtown Florence, as well as along other commercial streets in the city. Now, was it discussed by this committee about whether or not this resolution should call for more benches in Florence when we, when we know that some of the feedback was that some don't really want them? Is, is it the intent of the committee to keep that language in calling for in Florence? I believe so. Okay. Yeah, we want to go no, beyond our three benches. <laughs> or Denton and Florence. Yeah, I think it's just for consistency's sake as well. Exactly. All right, so it looks like we have something. Pam, do you want me to send this to you? to that, especially knowing that the mayor had had a meeting with the Florence Business Association and they approved about the benches and that, so that was great. Okay, so we, we need to make a recommendation. Make a, uh, I need to recommend you Second. Favor. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for your input into that. That's done. Okay, I'll just do it very quickly. One second. Um, I'm going to speak about we have no meeting in the month of February. In the month of March, um, I have 
knew I had a coat of coat. The literacy. Literacy project, project coming in. Okay. Okay, at 405. And the senior center coming in. This is yeah, if you can think of anybody that you would like to bring for the month of March. Okay. In addition to that. At 530. <coughs> we can fill that right in. And also for the month of April, I talked with um, our former mayor, Mary Claire Higgins, of bringing in community action. They have not been here for a while. Mm -hmm. And if you could think of any other agency that you would like, please let me know. Because there's a lot of them that I need to bring in. Thank you.